Bruchem Aboyim. Welcome, everyone, and uh, welcome to our home. The, um, my thought tonight uh, will be on uh, one of the portions, and we'll talk about again. It's called Bullock. Uh, this week's topic on my thought is about the eighth portion in the fourth book of the Torah, the portion of Bullock. Altogether, there are only six portions in the Torah that are named after people. For the most part, those six people that are named are really named after all righteous individuals. Noach, Chayesorah, Yisro, Pinchas, and even Korach. Though he sinned grievously, but still he had convinced himself that his intentions were noble. He saw his rebellion against Moshe as an attempt to reach an even higher spiritual level. He was blinded by his own desire for glory, which was guised as a desire for a greater sense of spirituality. Now, Bullock, on the other hand, was an anti-Semite. He hated the Jewish nation. Some commentaries say even more than Bilaam. It's an interesting fact that if you were to take the first two letters in Bilaam's name, which is a Bayes and then a Lamed, and then you would add the first letter of Bullock's name, again, which is a Bayes, it was spelled the Hebrew word belev, which translates to mean with the heart. If you combine the remaining two letters in each of their names, it spells out the name Amalek. Now, Amalek was the first nation to attack the children of Israel shortly after they left Egypt. So both Bilaam and Balak were on the same wavelength as the nation of Amalek. They, too, hated the Jewish nation and wanted to destroy them. So the question becomes, why would the sages name a portion after such a person? I think that there are important lessons that we can learn from their choice. As it states in Pirkei Avot and the Ethics of the Fathers, Benzoma said, who is a wise man? He who learns from every person. The portion of Balak has no paragraphs, whereas the next portion of Pinchas has 34. Our sages tell us that the reason for the paragraphs in the Torah was to give Moshe the time to comprehend and internalize what God Almighty had just taught him when he was on the mountain for the 40 days. There are no paragraphs in the portion of Balak to indicate that Bilaam was not concerned at all about learning anything from God. He was only concerned about his own honor and selfish agenda. You know, many times in life, those who hate us become our greatest teachers. It, it does seem strange. However, if you think it, about it, people who like you, especially good friends, are more often than not careful not to hurt your feelings. Even if they give you constructive criticism, they try to do so with kind and gentle words. The problem with that type of advice is that they more often than not water down their comments to the point that it doesn't really sound like much of a problem at all. So then there exists the real possibility that you might miss their point completely. Then there are, the, there are other people who are so strong-minded and argumentative that you never want to offer any constructive criticism to them about anything. Somehow, whatever you say to them creates disagreements. They find it difficult to entertain any opinion other than their own. They have to convince you that you are wrong, and they are right, of course. So in this scenario, many times we just hesitate to say anything to such people. After all, who, who wants to get into an argument, especially when it creates hard feelings amongst friends? So what we find is that many times the best and truest criticism that we hear is from people that don't really like us or even our enemies. When they offer their observation, well, it's usually intended to expose our faults and failures. They don't sugarcoat anything. In fact, the more uncomfortable that they can make you feel, well, the better they like it. Of course, the fact that an enemy tells you something doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Truth is not their objective. Their goal is only to cause you some pain or difficulty. What we have to acknowledge is that in every lie that people tell us, there is always some thread of truth. 
You know, we see in the Torah that when Korach mounted his rebellion against Moshe, the first thing that Moshe did was to fall on his face. But why? Well, before he reacted to Korach's complaint, he first wanted to ascertain whether Korach's rebellion was the result of his jealousy and arrogance, or was he a messenger sent by God Almighty to rebuke Moshe for some of his actions? Once Moshe concluded that the rebellion was all about Korach and his ego, and that he was not speaking for God, then Moshe took the appropriate action. You know, Bullock had a real problem. The Jewish nation was camped on his border with an army that was 600,000 men strong. They had just defeated and battled both the armies of Sichon and Og. These were the two nations that the other nations of the land paid tribute to. They were, they were hired to be the guardians and to protect their land from any invading armies. Yet both Sichon and Og had been totally defeated, wiped out to the man by the Jewish army. So confronting the Jews in battle was seen to be an exercise in futility. You know, Bullock was not a fool. He knew that he needed to find some other means to defeat the Jewish nation other than war. Now, this was a time in history when sorcery actually existed. So he concluded that sorcery would be the only method that could possibly defeat them. Interestingly enough, Bullock himself was a great sorcerer. That being the case, so why did he need to hire Billam? Now, it seemed that though Bullock was a greater sorcerer than Billam, <clears throat> still Billam possessed one attribute that Bullock needed. Our sages tell us that God Almighty gets angry once every day. Billam was aware of that exact moment, and so he was able to attach his curses to that precise time. And that is where he derived his power. So Bullock was like a blind man with a, a powerful weapon. What he needed was someone with sight to direct him so that he could destroy his target. And that is why he hired Bilm. As Rashi tells us, he realized that bringing in mercenaries would be a waste of both time and money. So from Bullock we learn before we act, we need to analyze the situation and then weigh the consequences of our actions. Once he investigated and found that Moshe, the leader of the Jewish nation, attained his power from his mouth, that being the case, he searched for someone who could compete with Moshe's greatest attribute. A great lesson for us as we approach all of our challenges. Look before you leap. Now Rashi tells us that the nations of the world could have complained to God Almighty saying that if they had been given a prophet on the level of Moshe, that they too would have been more godly. However, we see that there was a great difference between Moshe and between Bilaam. Moshe was totally dedicated to God Almighty and the Jewish nation. Bilaam, Bilaam's focus was totally on himself and on the possibility of him acquiring financial gains. He was arrogant and self-centered. Bilaam was motivated by greed and hatred. These negative emotions blinded him to the truth that surrounded him. You know, as Helen Keller once said, that the only thing worse than being blind is not having any vision. How is it possible that his donkey could see the angel of God that stood on the road with a drawn sword? And Bilaam could not. He had tunnel vision. His thoughts, his focus was on the honor and financial gains that he would receive after he succeeded in bringing about the defeat of the Jewish nation. In the end, all he succeeded in doing was to bring about his own untimely death. His greed caused him to ignore all logic and reason. You know, he was talking to his donkey as if they had conversations all the time. The fact that his donkey was talking to him really should have been a wake-up call. It should have made him realize that he was treading on thin ice. The angel that addresses him, and the, the Torah refers to as the Sutton, one of the names that we give to the devil, the side of evil. Yet Rashi comments on these words and says, this angel was an angel of mercy and he desired to restrain Bilaam 
from committing a sin. Now, ten times in this portion, it states Malach Hashem, which means an angel of God. Now, according to the Gra, this corresponds to the ten messages that God sent to Bilaam in this portion, ten times, and in ten different ways, God attempted to save Bilaam from self-destruction. He, however, failed to understand the messages, which was unlike Abravinu, Abraham our father, who also faced ten tests, and he rose to the occasion each time. According to the Medrash, the main purpose of this portion was to explain why God removed prophecy from the non-Jewish world. But, but maybe the greatest lesson of all is, imagine if God invested so much time and effort in trying to save an evil person like Bilaam from sin and self-destruction, then how much more so does he attempt to direct us on the path of righteousness and goodness? We read in verse 21 that Bilaam got up early in the morning and he saddled his own donkey. Rashi comments on the verse and states, hatred caused him to disregard proper conduct since he saddled the donkey himself. His actions mirrored that of Agnovino, Abraham our father, who also saddled his own donkey. He did so when he took his son Yitzchak up the mountain to be brought up as a sacrifice to God. What we refer to as the Akedah Yitzchak, the binding of Yitzchak. You know, it's written in the Torah that both Abravinu and Bilam took Shnei Na'arav, two lads with them when they traveled. It states in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, that one that the Hebrew word Na'ar, which means lad, alludes to both of their individual character traits. The Hebrew word Na'ar is spelled Nun, Ayin, and Resh, which is an acronym for the Hebrew words Nefesh, meaning soul, Ayin, meaning I, and Ruach, meaning spirit. The Mishnah states that whoever possesses these three character traits is a disciple of Abnuvinu. They are Nefesh, Shephela, a meek soul, an Ayin Tova, a good eye, and a Ruach Nechama, the Mucha, pardon me, and a humble spirit. This was in contrast to the disciples of Bilam, who possessed the opposite character traits, a nefesh rechava, a greedy soul, an eye in raw, an evil eye, and a ruach gavoa, and an arrogant spirit. That being the case, how could God Almighty speak to such a vile person as Bilam? In addition, how could he be perceived by the Gentile nations as a prophet? Well, Bilam's sins were for the most part of a private nature, bestiality, coveting, honor, money, etc., it was quite possible that the populace was not aware of his true nature. Only God was privy to that information. In addition, these negative traits may have matured, even festered, as he gained notoriety. Before then, these personal deficiencies may not have been visible to the public, again, since they were private thoughts and actions that he entertained. We only know about them because the Torah exposes Bilaam for who we really was at his core. So how are we to view Bilaam? You know, they tell a story about a man who was known for his hospitality. Even though he was relatively poor, he still invited guests to share his food and living quarters. Now the Apta Rebbe, Rabbi Heschel, Yeshua Heschel of Apt, heard about this individual and decided that he wanted to see for himself if the rumors were true. And so he went to the village where this man lived, incognito. He knocked at the door of the small hut, and the host answered and graciously invited him in. The host asked him if he was hungry and if he wanted to join him and his other guests for dinner. The Optor Rebbe nodded, and so the man offered him a seat on a simple wooden bench while he prepared the meal. Now the table that he was setting was made up of bare wooden planks. The host was busy setting the table for his guests with wooden plates and cups and utensils. Now the Rebbe could see that his lips were moving. So the Rebbe got close enough to hear the host as he was speaking to God. He was saying, Dear God, I know that my guests are royalty 
and that they deserve only the best. Please, in your mercy, have them perceive this table with its place settings as a marble table set with only the finest china and silver. Then as the host was serving the meal of potatoes and bread to his guests, the Rebbe heard him speak again quietly to God, asking God to forgive him for the meager meal of bread and potatoes that he was serving. He said that he knew that he should serve them only the finest delicacies. He then asked God that he should make this meager meal appear to them as fat and quail with all the fine trimmings. The host then asked the Rebbe if he wanted to spend the night. The Rebbe said that he would. The host then prepared a bed made out of boards, straw, and rags. As he was preparing the bed, the Rebbe heard him once again speak quietly to God. He said that he knew that his guests were all princes and that they deserved only the finest goose down pillows and fine linen. But all that he could offer them were these boards, straw, and rags. He prayed that God Almighty should make the bed that he had prepared for them seem as a bed fit for royalty. In the morning, the host offered his guests what little food that he had before they departed. He did so with a smile and gracious demeanor. So as the Opta Rebbe was leaving, he blessed the man that he should be able to continue to host people in his home. He blessed them they should be able to fulfill his wishes of hospitality in riches rather than in poverty. And with that, the Opta Rebbe went on his way. Well, sometimes late, later, news reached the Opta Rebbe that his blessing had been fulfilled and that the poor host had become very wealthy. However, he was also told that ever since the host had become wealthy, the door to his mansion had been shut to the poor and the needy. He had become a miser. His butler was ordered not to allow any poor people to cross the threshold of his mansion. Now, as one can imagine, the Opta Rebbe was very concerned. But before he acted on the news, he first wanted to investigate for himself to see if the rumors were true. And so he traveled to the mansion of the host to see for himself. When he knocked on the door of the mansion, the butler told him to leave quickly, since his master did not take kindly to strangers. The Rebbe walked right past the butler, and he told him to inform his master that the Opta Rebbe had come to see him. Well, the now rich miser came down to see the Rebbe. The Rebbe was looking out the window in the parlor as the rich man entered. The miser stopped and was admiring himself in the mirror, twisting his handlebar mustache. The Rebbe said to the miser, isn't it strange that when I look out the window, I see other people. And when you look into the mirror, all you see is yourself. Well, the miser dismissed the Rebbe's comment as trite. He explained, well, my glass is covered with silver and yours is not. The Rebbe turned to him and said, exactly. When a person looks through glass, he can see other people and help them with their difficulties. However, when the glass is covered with silver, wealth, then many times all they see is themselves. So, so why is this portion called Bullock and not Bilam? After all, the main character of the portion is really Bilam. Now, the fact that Bullock wanted to harm the Jewish nation was predicated on a legitimate concern. He wanted to protect his people. He was their king, and it was his responsibility, his duty. But Bilam, he had nothing to fear from the Jewish nation. He didn't care about the Midianite or Moabite nations. His main concern was for himself and for the money that he would be paid for cursing the Jewish nation. So the reason that the portion is named Bullock may well connect to the fact that his descendant, Ruth the Moabitess, would be the grandmother of Governor Melech, King David, and the progenitor of the Messiah. May he come quickly and in our time. So what merit did he possess? What action did he perform to be connected to the illustrious Davidic dynasty and the Messiah? Bilaam had instructed Bullock to bring 42 sacrifices to God in the hope that he could curse the nation. And even though Bullock brought those sacrifices for the wrong reason, his intent 
was to be able to curse the Jews. Nevertheless, he showed honor to God Almighty. And for that action, he received a great reward. Or did he? You know that Balak was an anti-Semite. That being the case, why would he want to be the progenitor of the Messiah? Balak knew that Ruth the Moabitess would be his descendant. We read in the portion of Balak that he asked Bilaam to orally curse me. He was willing to be cursed himself in order to ensure that he would have nothing to do with fathering the savior of the Jewish nation. So was he blessed or cursed? What we see is that that which may be perceived as a blessing to one person may well be seen as a curse to another. This is an important lesson for us to learn, that all good deeds that we perform will be rewarded regardless of our intent. But imagine how much more reward we will receive for all the Torah that we learn and all the mitzvot that we perform with the proper thoughts and intentions. And with that thought in mind, let us hope to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sakenu quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. May God bless you and yours with safety, health, and success. Again, you should uh, enjoy everything. And uh, let me wish you again a good Shabbat Shalom. And uh, again, thank you for attending.